the Rontegui wreck. It's right there, out there. It's got to be somewhere around there. I know two men that know where it is. I think they dived it in 2017 last. They went looking for it as well. So I think I might have to have a chat with them. It's Paul Carre and Phil Worry. It's got to be out there somewhere. Ready to be rediscovered. Hasn't been dived for years and years and years. The Richard Keane found it. Star 1880. So there's a whole year's worth of papers in here. It's very delicate. It's been kept upstairs. You can see the covers falling off. So we're looking for March 1880. Recovery of another body from a wreck of a French fishing boat. This afternoon, pilot caught a vanilla. Came from St. Sampson's, landed the body, picked up near the wreck of the fishing smack of Totney. The jewels. It's another, another shipwreck we need to find. The jewels. There's probably not much left of it now. Oh, and here we have it. The wreck of the steamer Rontigui. At low water, a considerable portion of her mast down almost to the deck were visible. It was found that she was lying on her beam ends on the rock, about two miles northwest of Fort Le Marchant. But the wash of the sea was so great around her that nothing could be done to save anything from her. So the wreck happened on the 16th of March, so we're on Tuesday the 16th of March 1880. Um, all the local stuff is in these columns. And if you follow down here, we have wreck of a French steamer off the north of the island. Early this morning, intelligence reached town that a large steamer had gone down to the north of the island and various startling rumours were quickly in circulation after we were able to gather the following reliable facts as to the nature of the catastrophe. The vessel was an iron screw steamer, 555 ton register, laden with iron ore and about 12 tons of wine. The total cargo being 1,000 tons. Her name is the Rontigu, spelled incorrectly. Commanded by Captain August Lefeur, bound for Moran in Algiers for the Dunkirk port, which he left on the 9th instant. And proceeded all the way right through 10 miles north of the Cape Finisterre. This is it. I'll have a good read of this. Because of researching for these shipwrecks, you just gotta keep looking through the papers for months and months afterwards, and you find little bits, sales and auctions of uh, stuff that's come off the shipwreck. Can tell you quite a bit about what's left now in the shipwreck. There's no point looking for anchors if they got salvaged and uh, been sold. It's quite nice to see who's bought them as well. Might have been repurposed and put in another boat. So we found another article here on the Rontegui. Uh, this is the 25th of March, 1880. The Rontegui, the wreck of the steamer lost on the Boudinor Rock on the north, northward of the island was by direction of Mr. J.C. Lamont, French consul, visited today by Captain Montague Jones, Mr. Domal and Captain Longley surveyors. At low tide, they found the wreck covered by three feet of water lying on her port side with her stem partially broken away in considerable depression. After a careful examination, as far as was possible, the surveyors came to the conclusion that she was quite impractical to raise the wreck or do anything profitable with it. It is therefore practically abandoned and should a northwest gale set in, it will soon break up. So it looks like only just a couple of weeks after it went aground, it was broken up pretty severely. So I've read this paper right through to August now and I can't see anything else in it, on 10th of August 1880. 
seems to have run dry. So we'll have to try and pick up our research somewhere else. Have to go and dive it. So now we've got some extra uh, research done. We know we know a bit more about the wreck now. So hopefully we can piece it all together and find out what this thing actually looks like on the seabed now. This one, the Rontigui. Yeah. French iron steamship. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, Salved by everybody and his granny in the 70s, like everything else around here. Yeah, there'd be nothing left of it. Should we just say the usual suspects? Yeah. No lives were lost on this one. I'm sure you had a cargo of iron ore and 85 casks of wine. Then there's no cask of wine left on it, eh? Yeah. Imagine the vintage on that. Oh, God, it'd be uh, worth a few bucks. And the captain was Auguste Lefer, and there was 18 crew on board. Single boiler, two cylinder engine. And she hit uh, Petty Rock and Ord. Petty? Yeah, Petty Rock and Rock and Ord. It was believed to be this, uh, the ore that it was carrying and wrecked its compass or was plain silly. Things with its compass, so. And I've got a feeling this was last dived by Phil Warrior and Paul Carr on the 28th of Feb 2017. Long time ago. We're going to go find it, took two dives to find it, so hopefully uh, we'll find it again. Fingers crossed. So she left Oran uh, Tuesday 9th of March with her cargo of ore and her wine. She travelled at nine knots. And on the night of Monday, the 16th of March 1880, Hit the rocks. Hit the rocks. So, and there's the rocks she hit. Hello. And it's uh, this is uh, quite no, scary, but it's we seem we're being close, very close. It's shallow, dangerous. Yeah, we're going in together. Going together, coming out together. Yeah, so we got to re rediscover it, as it were. Yeah, so we got a horrible uh, reef just here, and there's a horrible head just there as well. See it just sticking out of the water. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have been visited here. You reckon? Yeah. There's, there's a head outside this one, eh? Yes. Yeah, there is. Yeah, I have visited here. The story is there's three heads. Um, it's in or about the third one, the inner one. There's one, two, there's one right here. So I don't know, I reckon jump in between this between, one. Yeah, one. probably these two, I reckon. Yeah, about a bit. Yeah, that's uh yeah, there's another head point. even closer, I think. Eight. Eight. Yeah, there's what there's a head here, a head over there, and a head here. Oh, and right. a head out there as well, look. Yeah, this this it's a multitude of enhancements. It's this it's, it's nasty all round, isn't it? <laughs> there's them rocks, apparently they hate the bottom of boats. Really? They just rip them apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the rocks that are bad, it's the limpets, you gotta watch out for them. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> Here. Yeah. Oh, there's, if it's your third head here, there's one, two, three. Oh, yeah, there's one, two, three, four. Yeah. One, two, four around, around the second. Maybe a bit further in that way. So, let's go and have a look. What can go wrong, eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what can't go wrong? <laughs> right, see you in a bit. Yeah. 
We start off our dive descending down to 6 metres. As you can see, it's shallow water and it's covered in seaweed everywhere. I think the trick here is going to get down between the seaweed and see what we got. From here I can just about work out shapes and bits of rust. This must be the wreck. As you can see there's a bit of ground heave here and you can see the seaweed going left to right. This motion can make you a little bit uncomfortable. So there's a big lump here, I'm not quite sure what it is. It's probably the highest part that's around this area. It's completely covered in kelp. You can see that's definitely a man-made structure. It's actually very hard to distinguish what is rocks and what is shipwreck. So this is where we get right down underneath the kelp to have a good look. This place is just so overgrown. I don't know how we're going to find anything here. Well, find anything we recognise or we can work out as a bit of a shipwreck. There is telltale signs that it's a shipwreck. It's a snake lock on enemy, so we must be shallow. So I'll go back to where I was, where I dropped in, and I pointed to just before. And it's a round tube of some sort. I kind of get in flashbacks to the Channel Queen video, because this is exactly what I found on that shipwreck. So I stopped recording for probably 10 minutes, just to have a look, see if I can trim the kelp back and try and figure out what I'm looking at. It's kind of hard to figure out what it is, but there's definitely rods and push bars and stuff. I'm still unsure what this actually is. There's still plenty of seaweed left on it. It's been down here 140 years, so 141 years. That looks very cylindrical, almost like a piston. But I'm not quite sure what this part is in the middle. Whatever this thing is, it's been split in half. Quite a bit of force. Could have been explosives. Could have been the ocean. Either way, you can see this at one time. We're together. Gonna come back to the bottom part and just have a little look at that. So this is the second part. The amount of different variety of seaweed on the shipwreck, because it's so shallow. Just having a look at underneath here now. Kinda looks like a piston. Can't figure out what it is. Still. This has gotta be the engine. If it is the engine, it's, it's leaning over to the port side. 
which is exactly the same as what is said in the report on the newspaper in our research. Well, saying it's leaning to port, I'm only guessing it's leaning to port because I don't know which way's forward and which way's back. This is definitely the engine. This is definitely the cylinder. The only thing that makes me think it's leaning to port is the fact that the pressure pipes, main steam pressure pipe, is always on the front of these engines and that's the uh, thing we looked at just before. Yeah, this is the top of the cylinder. Definitely, this cylinder is larger than the other cylinder and the larger cylinders are towards the stern of the boat, which is the back. Yeah, I'm quite confident now we've found the engine. Well, there's one thing that has worked out. The fact that this is a two-cylinder and we are looking at a boat that had a two-cylinder steam engine on it. So, so far, so good. Uh, uh, one cylinder, two cylinder. When we were still on the boat, me and Phil agreed if we found anything, we'd send the delayed up and we'll give it a couple of jostles. You can just see Phil doing it here. When we get back to the surface, we'll let Paul know we've found the engine. So now, we think we're going to the stern. We keep finding loads of bits of wreckage that's in between the rocks. This thing is well and truly snapped apart. This we think is a deadlight off of one of the portholes, which Jen found, jammed in between two huge rocks. There's no way of getting that out. As we're swimming south, away from the heads, we discover this part which to me either looks like the rob rail on the side of the boat or in fact it could actually be the keel. This shipwreck is just so confusing because it's so smashed up. It's like a really complicated jigsaw puzzle without the a picture to try and work out where we are and what we're doing. Don't know what this is. It's like some old cordage that someone's tied onto the side of the boat. Possibly an old shot line. It is this the prop shaft? It looks to be in the correct place and it looks to be the correct diameter. This is a large cylindrical shaft. So when we're looking at shipwrecks we tend to follow these things and when you follow them and you get to the end of the debris field that's normally the stern of the boat. Hmm, this is just taking us to a a hob or a boss. You can see the bolt holes in it. It's sheared off. The back of the boat seems to be missing. Oh, hang on. What's this in the weed? Ah, the boat looks to be snapped in half. It changes direction. This is a really thick piece of steel here. And I mean really thick, so that must be the, the kill. You can work out a shape. Look, it's sitting on top of some rocks.
So if I'm now underneath the keel, and this is the shape of the V of the back of the boat, we keep swimming towards where Jen is, we should hit the stern. We have a few different types of kelp in the Channel Islands. We have golden kelp and sugar kelp, and also forest kelp. This forest kelp has got a stipe, which is this long bit that holds a frond on the top. This is the only type of kelp where you get other kelp encrusting on the stipe. I'm starting to get a little bit excited when I see this. So I'm sure I've uh, figured out what it is as soon as I take that first bit of seaweed off. might spend a little bit of time and pulling everything off but before I pull it all off I want to just take a little bit of video footage of it while it's all covered Bill's already doing the customary swim through he's probably the first person to do that in a few years That's actually a really tight hold. I think I'm going to have to go down feet first. This is a prop shaft with some sort of rope wrap around it. And this is the underside of the hull. So this would be the starboard side and the top would be the port side. Mm, something's a bit weird here because when it went aground the vessel was on its port side in the news report. Maybe this has snapped off since then in the bad weather and fallen up on the other side. Let's explore this little part now. So we've explored the engine area and now we've found the extreme stern. So now we can plot out the back of the vessel on our charts. It's about time I check my dive computer. I've been down here 47 minutes and 26 seconds. I can still stay down another 99 minutes if I wanted to. Let's just check how much air I've got. 100 bar, so just under half a tank. This looks like a feather duster worm. Here we can see the peened surface of a river. So that's the backside of it that's been mashed flat. Not sure what this is, but there's a few of them just on the uh, seabed right next to the side of the boat, which would actually be inside the boat. It's a brick with basically two square holes in. Mm, not sure what that is. We'll leave it there. Here you can see two plates with these round holes in, so this is where the outside plating would have been riveted together. 
This was a traditional way to build boats before World War II, when welding was invented. It's got 80 bar left. I've been down 55 minutes. I think 55 minutes is long enough. Poor Jen, she's in a wetsuit. She must be freezing. Well, that was an adventure. The propeller, I can't believe we found the propeller. Yeah, that's not what I remember then. Oh, you could spend hours down there. We we almost spent an hour on that wreck. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't I've haven't got a photograph of the uh, Ron Digby. So no. what did you think of that, Phil? Nice. That was a proper adventure for I'm me. Glad we found the props. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. Quite a huge in the So I've seen a engine which was like sheared in half between both cylinders. Which is good I see the uh, twin cylinder because that's what it should have had. Well, Didn't see no boiler. Did you no, see a boiler? No boiler at all. All I saw was the prop shaft first and then I followed it out and it wasn't until you pointed it out that I realised it was the uh, propeller. Propeller, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you found the hole, you went down the rudder hole inside. Right. It wasn't until you give it a good clean up you can then you appreciate can the it. size of it. Then you can then step back. Yeah. So she must have been steaming when she hit the rocks because two of her propeller uh, blades are snapped off. And it's of no, no monetary value, that's why it's still left there. Yeah. Good drop on the skipper. Yeah. That was a good drop. Yeah, straight on that. So what made you go look for that one then, Paul, that wreck? Just because it's a wreck and yeah, you needed to find we it. We knew it was there, we knew it had been sold in the 70s and no one had seen it, seen it, you know, since. So, yeah, it was one of the ones that took us a few years to find. Yeah. That's the thing though, you just got to get your confidence to get right in next to that head. So. And it's quite close. I was glad I was out here with you, to be honest. <laughs> well, the people wanted to take my rib in that close. <laughs> yeah, it's quite close in there. I know, I mean, from what you say, it's all sandy off, off in the, in the outside of the... Yeah. Outside of the head. Uh, it's certainly clear on that side of the head, because I've been everywhere there. Yeah. On that side. Yeah, it's just weird how the uh, propellers head towards the reef. You'd expect it to have gone off into the reef, but it seems to be the other way around. Sorry? Are all the planes accounted for? Uh, no, I don't think so. I wonder if, she, if it came over the top of the, the, the heads there, yeah. ripped the blade off that might be on the other side, yeah. and then went down. Yeah, I reckon it could be, yeah. So I think there's two blades that are missing off of it. It's uh, the French tend to have four bladed props, so and that one's got a four blade, so. Oh, I enjoyed that. That was a proper sense of discovery, that rediscovering it. The kelp that had been on there had been there for a long time. There's a lot of kelp on it. Uh, I'm it's so there ready. excited when I, when I saw the, the boat. And then you, you can see, see right inside on that one. It's a proper boat. Yeah. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, that shipwreck. Eh? You're putting it, it all together and figuring out where it is, how it's laying. I swam right out onto the sand. Yeah. To see if I could see anything out on the sand, but no. Then I lost you and I came to the surface and said, Paul, it's a twist cheek I was still on the engine cutting stuff off. But it's nice, we've, we've done that one now, but there's still a lot more to do on that. A lot more bigger. research. We need to figure out how it's laying and get a sketch done of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. But you can see, uh, look at this, all of these rocks. 